You know, well, I mean, so like, for you, what were the biggest surprises? You thought all that, and then something else happened. What were the big surprises? Well, I think just there, there's a few pieces. Like for us, it's making bad moves just in terms of like packaging changes and things like that. Um, I wasn't surprised after getting into the first, you know, 12 to 24 months of, oh, this is what a PL is going to look like when you aren't at scale, right? If you're doing a million, two million, three million, ah, even if you only have three people on your team, oh, wow, it's really thin. You know, I just, I, you know, coming off a thing where, where I've done a consumer good product before um, that was not uh, duplicate, you know, I always use the term duplicate, mode, where it's not repeatable sales, right? which is why I wanted to get into food and beverage. Like I wanted to understand what does it look like to acquire a customer and actually get them to repeat by because that's where the money is. Well, at the end of the day, you start learning like, wait, but there's like all these other lines in there. And so one of the big ones is really understanding your margin. Like people think that they, they know what their margin is and you could probably come across this a lot too. They really don't. They, they, they don't understand that there was waste uh, within the, their, their ingredient run, like, like literally waste. Uh, it could be through moisture. It could be because the, the homie uh, is dropping uh, 10 pounds of flour on the, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. But, but these are so important. People are like, like they, it goes over their head, but, but this is real. The second thing is going to be the big one, which is trade spend. The other thing that nobody really truly understands, like what's your trade spend? I think it's like, it's like it's not 20 per, no, it ain't homie. No, it ain't. <laughs> let, let me let me see those books real quick. No, oh, wait, what about this? Is it no, your trade spends like 35%. No way. And it, it kind of ha has to be as you're growing because no one knows who the hell you are. And so it's right. not even like necessarily your fault. It's a like, kind of has to be that high as you're ramping up. I, I always say it's not a, it's not even a, a big subject, meaning like like no big deal. Like, oh wait, you just found out your trade spends actually 35%. Well, the, the thing is, it's no big deal that you're spending to get trial, right? It, it's all good. Um, but the reality is if you're off by 15 points, it's your entire business. So why do I got no money in my bank account? I'll tell you why. You know, so so it's just one of those things where even though you think you're being capital efficient, even if you have only four people on your team, even if you're not even going into DTC and you're not willing to, to, to buy an, a, a customer, like, oh, I'm just... You just don't really know your numbers. So so I, I I always put that on me. Like there were things that I was learning and even to today still learn through the process. But for anyone getting into this, you really got to have somebody on the team early who's going through every single detail with you, especially since we're talking about what it, it what what the subject is, which is you're raising capital, you're putting money in the bank. And you got to know where is that going to go and how fast is it going to be out of your account? Where then yeah, the, the, the big thing, I think people, you're right. People miss on gross margin and they don't know the real margin. They don't know waste. What they don't know even more is cash flow dynamics, not your net accrual numbers, but literally when is cash coming in, cash going out? Because you're going to get caught with your pants down. Everyone does. We, we had a Rite Aid order that, we're like, oh crap, we can't fulfill this. We don't literally don't have the cash. And you, you're not going to get a line of credit because you're not credit worthy as a money losing startup. Right. So either you raise money to, to, to make that run, or like we had to call our investor and we're like, hey man, we can't fulfill this order. Like we need a million bucks in a week. And he got us a million bucks and then we paid him back. But that was a cash flow thing. By the way, I, I may have to say this might be episode five because if it trickles in, you know, I do these in 15 minute increments. This might be episode five, part two of raising capital. I'm just noting that right now, just in case we need a bookmark. But I want you to restate that that comment. I want you to restate that story. It's it, nobody talks about stuff like this. Go give me that story. Well, more. I would say we are very. Uh, diligent about cash flow, and still we've got caught with our pants down five plus times just from a cash flow standpoint. Meaning, we literally could not fulfill a PO, um, and this has happened since we've been profitable too. Like people often think, "Oh, you, you get profitable, you're, you're good." No, actually, you're not. Oftentimes, your cash position gets in a worse place month over month because orders get bigger 
and you have to front more, especially for us, we buy our, our own ingredients. They sit on our own balance sheet. So now we have bigger cash outflows. And so even profitable businesses, you have these cash crunches and, and they can get really bad. And so I think this is like the least talked about and most important thing in CPG. But yeah, I mean, the anic specific anecdote is, I forget all the details, but basically we thought we might get into Rite Aid and we thought we get might get into a certain number of doors. And then they came to us and they said, well, actually, we're going to give you like four times that number of doors. There was a series of surprise to the upsides of like more doors and more SKUs. And, and we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, we can't do this. We straight up can't do this. And okay, we're like, and we ran through all the ways that you might be able to get money in a line of credit or a loan or this and that. And eventually we're like, there, none of these will work. So either we don't fulfill the PO and we lose out on Rite Aid or we figure something out. And then I called this guy, Court, who's a, our earliest investor, old, like super successful guy um, personally. And then he runs a super su successful business. And I was like, hey, man, um, I need a million dollars and I need it like very soon. And he's like, okay, like, let me, let me see if I can do it and I'll call you back. And he calls me back. He's like, okay, I can get you a million. And I think we structured it in, it was a note that converted into equity if we defaulted on it, which goes to show how much he believed in the business, right? Um, now he's going to crush it on, we actually did convert that to equity. And he's going to make an absolute killing on that. Um, but at the time, that was not obvious. And that that was a baller move on his part. So th that goes to show like your early investors are so important, so important because shit like that happens. And you, like sometimes you, you got to make a weird phone call at Friday at 2 p.m. Uh, um, that is an amazing story. Uh, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of that, though, that goes on. Right. And it goes, it also just goes to a people like, see, I wouldn't be able to do, who would I call the, that's just how it is. That's just. I didn't know. Also, I didn't know court, no relationship, not a family member. I met court through a friend of a friend and court is just a badass. Like, so it's not even, I think a lot of people are like, yeah, they, they kind of like victimize themselves. I, there's no way, like, yes, you actually can do that. You, you can find someone. And you can have a lot of conviction and convince them that you are the person to get this done and the product is going to work and get it. Like it is all possible. I really like that you said that. And I like that there is that backstory to it because there's all types of backstories. There is folks who are like, yeah, but you called your uncle. Yes, because that's his uncle. And that was the card that he was dealt, right? Then there's folks who... Um, who didn't know anybody and they just, like you said, I love that word, had conviction. They, they had a product or a, an idea that they just knew was not only going to work, but that they really wanted to dive deep into it. And they had the fortitude to start picking up the phone and or triangulating. I always say that the reality is you do know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody's brother, sister's daughter. That's for sure. And as long as you get your 10 minutes just to provide some information, you never know what's going to happen. Um, and, and you know what people will always pay for? A PM. If you can't get someone to front you some money to pay for new business that benefits their stake in your company, you're probably not cut out to be an entrepreneur, right? So it's, it's a very different thing to say, hey, Rite Aid came in for this giant order that's going to have this net profit and show them all the numbers. That's a very different scenario than, hey, I kind of just need a million bucks, like, right? So there's a, a quality of ask that that you that you want to consider too. I, I like this topic. We, I, I'm concluding it there. There's a lot. There's a lot there. But in episode six, which we'll get to. We're going to talk about, we're going to conclude this and talk about the industry as a whole. So I think it'll touch a little bit on, you know, some financing and, and raising capital and the like, but that's just a good, good way to conclude um, on, on, on the fundraising topic.